That song we just sang a few moments ago, I labor on through weakness and rejoicing. That was a, a poignant line for me, maybe for you. Sometimes I don't know if you're like me, you just sing the words, you don't, you go through the motions. But this morning, personally, I needed to hear that, I needed to sing that, maybe you did as well. Our shepherd will defend us and hold us. Those of you in person and online, he's with us, and we need to know that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, all the glory does belong to you. And as we sang, we're choosing to rejoice, even sometimes we don't feel like it. And we're trusting that the things that we sing and that your word says is true. And we pray this and we ask that you would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. When we planned this series called Questioning God a number of uh, weeks ago, months ago actually, I was thinking about how, how important it would be for all of you. I know you have questions. I know God's people and people that you interact with have questions and doubts and issues. And I thought, well, it'll be important for you. It'll be equip you to ask the right questions and give you language for some of the things you wrestle with in your faith. I did not anticipate how important it would be for me. Would it surprise you to know that your pastor asks questions too? That uh, I wrestle as well? And every time I read the Psalms, and I've been reading the Psalms both in preparation for the sermons, and my wife and I are doing this devotion called the Psalms in 30 Days. There's three readings a day, and I'll confess, sometimes I skip and I have to cram at night or in the morning, but we're reading through the Psalms together. I feel as if God is uh, teaching me a little bit more about how to pray. The Psalms have been called a school of prayer, and just reading them, you're absorbing a kind of language, a kind of world of prayer and of faith that I desperately need. I'll just tell you, sometimes I, and I like to... Uh, to come here and to, and to get my mind and, and heart uh, right before I preach in rejoicing and in faith and in joy, but I don't feel like that today. It's been a hard week uh, for me personally, for probably for many of you. Um, there's been some sad, there's always sadness in the world, but sometimes it comes closer to you, you know, it touches you. My administrative assistant and dear friend and sister in Christ, Jenny Caterer, whose uh, prayer, and she and Matt, their prayer has been to have a baby. And God blessed them with a baby girl, Kylie Joy, and she's on maternity leave, enjoying what it means to be a mom, found out that she has been diagnosed with multiple myeloma. It's not a good prognosis. I was in a home last night, uh, late with a family who's uh, facing an unspeakable crisis, a loss of somebody too young. Tragic circumstances. Did a funeral in this room yesterday for a, a friend. And so, you know, and I'm not, this is not complaining, I'm just saying it comes to all of us, right? And sometimes the things we sing, all of a sudden we're wondering, I need that to be true, Lord. I need your word to be true in this moment. And he is. The Psalms, as I said, have been called a school of prayer and we learn how to pray and we're going to school in them to give us answers to the questions we ask. Even the ones we don't speak out loud, but we wrestle with in our soul. And the question we're wrestling with today is about fear. You'll know this, most of you, that the most commonly given command in all the Bible is some form of don't be afraid or fear not. You've probably heard that before. And yet, I, I think it's fair to say that we live in a culture that's, fear is our currency right now. It's the, certainly the currency in our media and in, politi in politics and in just on, on social media. It's all around us. People giving in to fear, being marked by fear, led by fear. Fear is weaponized and used, and it certainly just sort of pervades the air we breathe these days. This has always been true, but I think over the last two years, it's acutely true. But the Bible calls us not to live with a spirit of fear, but a spirit of faith and power and love. And yet, that's hard, isn't it? It's not easy to do. Last weekend, I preached in a little church on the island of St. Croix called Sunny Isle Baptist Church. Before I came back to the cold and some really hard news, I was with some pastors in our denomination. Do you know we have churches in our denomination that are on St. Croix? I was glad to find that out and to go visit them <laughs> in January. I told them, you can come and visit our church in July, and I'll come visit your church in January. Deal? You know met these young pastors who are ministry on this island, and I asked, we, we, I, we spent some time in some training, some prayer together, um, and I asked them, I said, well, how can I pray for you? Pastor Enoch King. And he said, well, our island is under a spirit of fear. In 2017, Hurricane Martin devastated the island and destroyed most of the, all of our churches and so many homes, and we were just beginning to make progress in, in rebuilding when the coronavirus pandemic hit the island, and we locked down. It's been really hard. 
I feel like our people are under a spirit of fear. I said, well, it's not just your island. And I said, well, what are you gonna preach on? He said, I'm gonna preach on living with the spirit of faith, not fear. I thought, well, so are we this weekend. So right now, today, actually a couple hours ago, because they're ahead of us, uh, Pastor Enoch was preaching on this very same thing. We prayed for each other last night via text. He took me a spear fishing on my last day there. I don't mean like, I don't mean Tom Hanks in Castaway standing on the rocks like doing this. That would have been better, in my opinion. I mean, snorkels, fins, like swimming out past the reef, carrying your spear gun and a, and a bag in case you actually get something. And I found out something. I'm, te- I'm a terrible spear fisherman. Seriously, uh, he, he, afterwards he said, I would never have gone myself. It was too rough, but it was your only day, so I wanted you to have a chance. I'm like, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> By the time we got out past where the waves break, past the, the reef, I, I, I had a belly full of seawater and I was exhausted and I was more than a little bit scared. I mean, I was seriously, it was like, I, it, it took us like 40 minutes to swim out there. And when I got there, I, if a boat had come by, I would have got in and gone to shore. I was done. <laughs> we, were two, we had two and a half more hours. No life preserver. And like we're, when we're, <laughs> we're paddling out, and you can't, of course, talk. You have a snorkel on. But he would point, like, don't touch that. No, no, no. Urchins or whatever, fire, fire coral. So I'm, I'm panicking. I, I've never snorkeled before. I can't breathe very well. I'm trying to breathe. I'm trying not to touch all the things he says don't touch. I'm watching to see if there's any sharks. I heard reef sharks are in the area. I did see one. It was, I was more than a little bit scared. And uh, anyway, I caught, I shot nothing. Well, I did shoot my, the spear gun many times, but I hit nothing is what I meant to say. All I got was a belly full of seawater and some scraped up knees and chest from coral. And I, <laughs> I thought about that. I was praying as we paddled in and out. But I wasn't praying the kind of prayer we're going to look at in Psalm 27. So let me just ask this question. Would you rather live a life? It's an obvious question. Would you rather live a life paralyzed by fear or empowered by faith? How many of you would say, you know, if I had the choice... I think I'd like to be paralyzed by fear. I mean, when you really weigh it and consider, I, I want to be paralyzed by fear. I want to be stuck and wringing my hands and terrified. No, every one of us would say, well, yes, I'd rather be empowered by faith. But so few of us really live that way, myself included. Psalm 27, which we're going to look at, is really, it's a, it's a case study in what it takes to face our fears, to live a life empowered by faith. It's a psalm of David. It's a psalm of confidence and assurance in the midst of very fearful circumstances. Let's, I'll just read it and we can follow along the, the psalm in its entirety. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, My heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I'll be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not. O God of my salvation, For my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Read that psalm in Jenny's house when we prayed together on Friday. Read it many times since. Some of the psalms uh, of David include a historical note about the context in which he wrote them. Not all of them, but some do. We don't get that for this one. Clearly, he's facing uh, very difficult circumstances. Armies encamped against him, evil men uh, uh, proposing violence against him, false witnesses, threats on his life. And we don't know when that happened. 
But you'd think if, like, if somebody said, when was the time in your life an army was encamped against you? Or evil men threatened your life? You might think, uh, never. Or if it happened, it's probably only once. But the interesting thing about David's life is it could have been a number of times, historically speaking, in his life. David's life was a life that was not marked by easy circumstances and peaceful living all the time. It's interesting, isn't it, that that description could have been a number of scenarios that David actually lived through. And yet he wrote those words at those, in, the, in such circumstances. He didn't live a life marked by peace and comfort and ease and security, but he did live a life marked by faith, confidence in his God. There's a shift that happens halfway through the psalm we'll talk about, and some have speculated this is actually two psalms put together, but I don't think so because, first of all, we're given no indication of that. Second, the psalms themselves are songs meant to be sung by the people of God that go through a range of human emotions and experiences, and so it should be taken as a whole, as we'll take it with one theme and one message for us. As we've seen in this series, David here doesn't pretend that everything's fine. He doesn't ignore he doesn't try to just move on and deny what's going on in his life. And I, I so appreciate that. that the, Psalms are, the, Psalms, the Bible is an honest book, maybe the most honest book, and the Psalms are expressly honest, sp- specifically real, authentic about what's happening in our lives. Politicians make false promises. The Bible never does. The Bible and the Psalms are the most honest book. James chapter one tells us the Bible is a mirror. Have you ever read this before? The Bible is a mirror that that reflects to us an accurate picture of who God is, of who we are, and of what life is like. You know, sometimes we get distorted images. We look out at the culture, and that's reflecting back to you a false image of who God is, a false image of who you are, and a false image of what life is like. But the word of God is an accurate reflection, a true mirror. Sometimes you look in the Word of God and you don't like what you see. Isn't that true? Sometimes you look and it reflects back to you things about yourself that are hard to face, but it's for your good. Sometimes it reflects back to you things about God that you struggle to believe, but it's for your good. Sometimes it reflects back to you things about life that you wish weren't true, but it is. So it's an act of kindness and grace that God gives us a mirror that shows us reality, even if reality is hard sometimes. It would be unkind to give us this false image and pretend. So let's take Psalm 27 and see what is reflected back to us. I think Psalm 27 gives us a three-step approach or a strategy for praying through your fears. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that Psalm 27 is a strategy for life, an approach to life. We're going to call it three steps to praying through your fears. We've all got fears, those things we say, those, the, the what-ifs that run through our mind, those things we don't say, the deep fears. These three steps might sound simple to you at first, maybe even like simplistic, but I, 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 the longer I live, the more I am convinced that the most important things are in our life are not new. The most profound things are the simple things we fail to live and to take in. Number one, always start with God. Let's say that together. Number one, always start with God. How, what could sound more simple than that? When you're facing fearful situations, when you're facing your own fears, start not with your fears, but with God. But how often do we flip this around? I do. I start with my fears, and they grow in my mind. They become huge in my mind. And then I try to struggle my way, like swimming out to that reef, to find my way to God. But I'm swimming in an ocean of fear. David doesn't do that. He starts with God. It sounds so simple, but do you tend to begin with God when you're facing fearful situations? Or do you tend to run your mind in the what-ifs? A life paralyzed by fear is marked by the constant question, what if? What if this happens? What if this treatment doesn't work? What if, what if he makes this choice? What if it doesn't work out? But this is not where David starts. Look at the first six verses with me once more. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Right away, David tells us, the begin- like the, right here, the, the Lord. This is the first two words. The Lord is my light and salvation. Talk about starting with God. The first statement out of his mouth with all that he's facing is, who is God? Who is he and who is he to me? Who is he to you? Whom shall I fear? Then he asks the question. He doesn't start with who shall I fear. The Lord is a stronghold of my life. 
Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and, my, and foes, it's they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. He's talking about singing songs of praise and joy in the midst of fear. Go back one slide if you would. Back one, excuse me. They're right there, stay there. We'll come back to that in just a moment. He begins by affirming what he knows, not what he's unsure of. We tend to begin with what we're uncertain of. All the what ifs and the uncertainties. David begins with what he's sure of. I don't know how this is gonna work out. I don't know what this prognosis means. I don't know what the treatment will do to me. I don't know if it'll be effective. I don't know how I'm gonna pay this bill or I don't know how we're gonna make it to the end of the month. But here's what I know. One thing I'm sure of. I've been fighting for that this week. Maybe you have too. Bringing my mind back to the thing that I'm sure of. The solid place. He says, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. That's the place to stay, to start. So here's the question. What looms larger in your mind? Your fears, your difficult situations, or your God? If fear and uncertainty loom larger to you, it might be it's because that's where you spend most of your mental energy. How much time and mental energy do you give to meditating on the truth of God's word? Especially, I, I don't know about you, but I tend to run away from the thing I most need when I most need it. For example, when you have sinned, when you've, when you've, do, when you've done something that violates God's law, what you most need is to confess it and receive forgiveness and be reminded that he loves you. But we run away from that, don't we? We don't wanna do that. When you're feeling isolated and alone, what you most need is God's people to come around you and to encourage you, but sometimes we, we run away from that. We withdraw into ourselves. When we most need help, we're, we, we don't ask for it. We don't seek it. When you're fearful, what you most need is to run to the stronghold of your life. So maybe if, we're, if, if our fears loom larger than God, it's because that's where we're spending our mental energy. We haven't started in the right place. If you start with your fears, you stay there. It's hard to find your way to God when you start with your fears. Notice verse four, that's why I went back to the slide. This is verse four, one thing. He says one thing, like curly in city slickers, right? One thing, right? The one thing have I, whenever I quote a movie, it, it dates me a little bit. So the, th the three or four of you are laughing, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after. What's his one thing? Now, verse three says, an army is encamped against me. War is about to break out. Violent men are after me. What would be your one thing? Deal with them. Strike them down. Take them away. Handle, handle it for me, God. Is that David's one thing? I find this amazing and humbling. Talk about learning to pray. He doesn't pray about the stuff that he's facing. Like his singular focus, the, the theme, the thing he wants more than anything is not alleviation of his pain, is not for his enemies to go away, it's that he would what? Dwell in the house of the Lord. To gaze upon your beauty, to inquire in your temple. These are relational words. I wanna be with you, God. I wanna see you, God. I wanna talk with you and have you talk to me, God. I wanna press into my relationship with you. I wanna go deeper. I know that this is, of all that I'm facing right now, all the uncertainty, I need you, I want you. That's his one thing. What's yours? When you're facing fearful circumstances, what's the one thing you want more than anything else? If you stop and think about it, it's exactly what you need. What, you, what will get you through is a deeper relationship with God. Your relationship with God or mine, let's just take me, my, my relationship with God yesterday 
or on Thursday, or quite frankly, on Tuesday when I flew back from St. Croix. My relationship with God on Tuesday was good for what I experienced on Monday and on Sunday and on Saturday. But it's not sufficient for what was coming later in the week or what will come tomorrow. You can't rely upon your past experiences with God solely. You need to progress and to grow and to press into a deeper relationship. Those past things matter, but if that's where you're stuck, you need more of what God has for you. Have you ever had the experience where you face something in life and you go, I, I, my, the resources, the spiritual resources of my past relationship are not enough. I need something more right now, God. You ever felt that way? I need something more from you. And here's the good news. He has more for you. He wants to give you more. David says, one thing, Lord, the, Lord, I'm facing all this stuff. What I want is to grow in my relationship with you. Because if I don't have that, I got nothing. I can't make it. This is precisely what God wants. You're, in fact, I was thinking about this just last night you, when I watched uh, the Packers lose. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I, had to, I had to find a way. What, your fears and your struggles may be an, oppor an opportunity for this. The things that you're facing, which seem dark and dire and just overwhelming, may be an opportunity. Not that God caused them, that he's making them happen, but maybe the very opportunity, the crucible in which God wants to give you more of himself to deepen your faith. Notice also the source of David's confidence has nothing at all to do with himself. He's not like Peter. Remember Peter, Jesus says, you'll all fall away because of me. And Peter says to Jesus, no, 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 everybody else will, but not me. I never will. His self-confidence. Self-confidence is a path to nowhere. I spent a lot of my young adult years trying to be self-confident, confident in my ability on the football field or the wrestling mat or in myself. It fails. We all eventually come up against something. That's too big, too hard. David's confidence is not in himself at all, not in his ability, not his skills, not in what he can do. His confidence is in his God, solely. It's like what Paul says in Romans chapter eight, verses 38 to 39. We skip ahead there one more. For I am sure, and this word sure, uh, sometimes translated confident, certain, persuaded, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He doesn't say, I'm convinced that nothing bad will ever happen to me. That's not a promise. He says, I'm convinced that no matter what happens to me, none of it can ever separate me from God. Begin with God. Start with God. For I am sure, I'm 100% convinced, I'm persuaded, I know. This is the place to start always. Second, number two. Face your fears then in light of number one. I told you this was simple. But it's so important. Start with God, but then move into what you're, I mean, don't pretend like it's not there, whatever it is. Face it in light of number one. Move toward your fears in light of who God is and who you know him to be. We work the other way around, right? We start with the overwhelming, swirling ocean of our fears, and we're trying to swim our way to God, and it's like looking for it like a, a speck in the ocean. We can't find him. Start with him. And then let him turn you and face what's coming. With him, in light of him. Look at verses seven through 12. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You've said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help. So he's talking about his past. You have been my help. Cast me not off and forsake me not, O God of my salvation. My father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. 
There's a lot in this passage worth talking about. I want to look closely at the specific content of David's request to God. He says, let's go back a couple of slides to the first one, beginning this part, one more. Hear, hear, O Lord. He says, Lord, hear me. Be gracious to me. Answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, or face, Lord, do I seek? Hide not your face from me. So these are specific things David is asking God for. Next slide. Turn not your servant away in anger. Cast me not off, O God of my salvation. The Lord will take me in, a, a statement of confidence there. Once more. One more slide there. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me on level paths because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries. This is amazing. I don't know what your prayer list looks like when you're facing really hard stuff. But it's fascinating to look through and just, and just make note of what is David praying for specifically. Closeness to God does not equal comfort or security or ease or lack of trouble. Let me say that again. Closeness to God does not equal no trouble, no hardship, comfort. We tend to think it does in our culture. But that's not a promise the Bible makes. David said to God in verse 8, you said, seek my face. And he, I like this. He says, well, here I am. I'm seeking your face. You told me to do it. I'm doing it, Lord. So you better come through. Don't turn your face away. The face of God in Scripture is a fascinating metaphor. There's the great uh, uh, priestly blessing in Numbers chapter 6, which I often will end a service with. The Lord will make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The face of God is a symbol of his favor and blessing. But to see God face to face in the Old Testament would undo you. You couldn't handle it. Moses only saw a glimpse of God had to veil his face because even though the reflection of God's glory was too much for the people. But we're told in the New Testament, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that we with unveiled faces are beholding his glory. We have access to see God now face to face. So meaning, like moms and dads, when you're a little, when you're, when you're baby uh, your newborn baby is crying or you want them to look at you and you grab them by the cheeks, you know, or grandma and grandpa, and you look them right in the, right in the face, you want to make eye contact with you. That's the, that tender, beautiful image. That's what the Bible's saying. God, look me in the eyes. Don't turn your face away. Think about that image, turning your face away. I remember this girl I liked in high school turned her face away from me, both literally and figuratively. <laughs> I was trying to get to know her one time and I saw her and she was like, I know that she saw me and, I, and she saw that I knew that I saw, knew that she saw me, you know? And she just went, mm, and walked on by. It's funny how little things like that make an indelible impression on you. It's like a 15-year-old kid, like, she pretended she didn't even see me. David's saying, don't turn away. God looks at you and sees you and loves you. David says, of all that, that's going on, I need that. Your face, Lord, your blessing, your favor. Not in my circumstances, but in my soul. So I can face my circumstances. Verse 11 is amazing to me. Let's go forward. Oh, here, right there, right, stay right there. That's it, that's it. He says, teach me your way and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. I don't think I, I, I never grasped this before, but I've been pondering this. David said, this is verse 11 right here. Teach me to obey you and walk with you in obedience. Why? Because of my enemies. That's astounding to me. Is it, is it to you? If it isn't, you don't understand it yet. People are against me. When you think about those who oppose you in life, how often is your prayer, Lord, help me to be more obedient to you? Me? Never. I don't pray that way. Here's how I pray. Deal with them. Smite them, almighty smiter. Take them away. They're wrong, right? David says, Lord, these people are against me, but don't let this take me off track. Don't let this thing that I'm facing be a distraction to me and cause me to walk in disobedience. Whatever happens, Lord, keep me on the path. What a great prayer. What a great prayer. As I said, I'm learning to pray. Maybe you are as well. I don't know what this is going to work out, and they're threatening violence against me, but, I, but whatever happens, I don't want to disobey you. I don't want to be led down the wrong path. So teach me in this moment because of my enemies so that I'll stay faithful and so they might even see a witness in my life 
of obedience and faithfulness in the face of opposition. What a prayer. I want to live that way. You will not pray this way, by the, by the way, if you start with your fears. If you don't start with step one, start with God. You don't pray like this. You pray, get me out of this. You pray, I don't know what's going on. You pray, this isn't fair. I don't deserve this. Do something about it. But if you start with God and your one thing is to dwell in his presence, then this becomes your prayer. Paul, Paul puts it this way in Philippians chapter four, verses six through seven. Some of you will know this by heart. Do not be anxious about anything. That sounds really easy, right? Just stop it. Don't be anxious, right? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it doesn't even make sense from a worldly perspective. How can you have peace in this moment? Well, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So first, start with God. Get clarity on who he is to you. The certainty, you don't, there's a lot you don't know, but the things you know, declare to yourself. We talked about this last week in Psalm 42. Two, face your fears in light of step one. And number three, can you guess? End with God. Always end with God. I know, I told you, it's simple. But listen, bookend the, the junk in your life with God. Bookend your fears and your hardships and your difficult circumstances with faith, with who God is. He's, he tells us he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Start with him and end with him. In your life and in your prayer life. He is the beginning and he is the end. Let's read the last two verses of Psalm 27. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord. Now some of you may have the New King James, the King James translation, or even the New American Standard. It says, I would despair if I had not been convinced. That's a, we believe, a later addition, but probably an accurate one in terms of the spirit of the Psalm. But the earliest manuscripts say, I believe. David's saying, I believe, meaning I, I would despair if I didn't believe, but I do believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. A couple of phrases here. The goodness of the Lord, the land of the living. What is he talking about there? It sounds like David is saying, I'm convinced that I'm going to see God come through in my lifetime. That he's going to answer my prayers in this circumstance right now in my life. The land of the living. I'm living. This is my life. I want him to do what I am asking right now. That sounds like what he's praying or saying, doesn't it? Is that what he's saying? Well, if it is what he's saying, it doesn't always work out that way for David or for us. What does he mean? What does he mean by the goodness of the Lord? He says, I know that I will see the goodness of the Lord. Where else have you heard David talk about seeing? What's his one thing? Go back to verse four. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. To see you in your temple. David's one thing. The goodness of the Lord that he longs to see is not primarily circumstantial. It's in his, in his relationship with God. Which is, doesn't mean you don't pray for God to do things about your circumstances. Of course you do. I'm doing it right now for many people that I love, and so are you. Second, the land of the living. The land of the living may be this life, but there are some scholars who say, actually, this is the land of the living and the dying. The land of the living only is beyond the life beyond this life. David's looking through what we call the shadow lands, the land of life and death, where sin uh, it, it, it causes brokenness and things are not as they should be, to the land of, of, of eternal life, the land of the living. So maybe David is saying, I believe that I shall see, not just now, but someday, the goodness of the Lord in all of its fullness. We get little hints and glimpses in our soul and in life now, but it's imperfect and it's broken and it's sometimes dark. But I'm looking through to the real land of the living, believing that I'll see it. And then verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong, take courage, 
wait for the Lord. His last line to us and in his prayer in Psalm 27 is wait for the Lord. The Hebrew word for wait is the word kava. It's the same root translation for the word hope. By the way, in Spanish and in Latin, the root word's the same, esperar, for wait and for hope. We think of waiting as doing nothing. I hate waiting. You ever pull up to a drive through and like, mm, I'm not waiting in this line, right? At the teller, I got 30 seconds, you know, I got a busy life. Or you get annoyed with people that are ahead of you in line. That's not the kind of waiting he's talking about. I think for many of us, when we're facing fears, we, we tend to want to distract ourselves with empty pursuits, mindless scrolling, or binge watching on Netflix, or just something to take our mind off of it. That's not waiting. Waiting for the Lord is actively placing your mind back in the proper place on thoughts of God. Here's, the, uh, this, the, the truth is this. Fear and faith both demand that you place your trust in something you cannot see. You get to choose. Fear asks you to place your trust in things you can't see, doesn't it? Fear says, what if, what if, what if? These things that you can't see and you don't know, what if, they all, what if it's the worst case scenario? But faith also asks you to place your trust in someone you cannot see. I'm gonna close by reading to you something that Jenny Cater, I mentioned um, who she is and her situation. She sent this text to me at 5.30 this morning. And I was up praying over the sermon and saw this and I asked her if I could share this portion with you and she said, yes, may God be glorified in my weakness. She's in a hospital room right now waiting a biopsy later today. Here's what she writes. <clears throat> Sorry. I don't need to bow down to my anxiety. I need to persevere through it and do these things that I'm afraid until I'm no longer afraid. One day, when the routine settles in my brain and it's rewired for a new normal and I realize everything was safe and okay in the midst of my fear, my emotions will realize there's no need to be afraid. Everything is okay. I can make it. In fact, I am making it. God is with me. Whether I feel it or not, he's there. He's never once abandoned me in all my life and he's not about to start. He has always lifted me from this state after a period of struggle. Sometimes it takes months of crying out to him, but always he shows up. Lord, I feel like such an infant when it comes to faith. I can't yet hold up my head or feed myself. I rely on you to have the faith to rely on you. Did you hear that? I rely on you to have the faith to rely on you. Meet me at my most basic and primitive levels. I come to you with nothing, Lord. I am wholly reliant on you, like my baby Kylie relies on me. And even more so, Lord, I feel it. I have nothing. Take the spiritual infant and this spiritual infant and sustain me. Feed me on your truth. Fill me with your presence. Grant me your sustaining power. Infuse me with your hope and joy. Jenny prays like, like King David. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we too are like spiritual infants and we are tossed to and fro on the waves of this life and we are full of uncertainty and fear. And if we're honest, too often we turn our mind and our heart and our mental energies and our spiritual energies toward all of the what ifs. We let fear fill us and we feel lost and we don't know how to find our way to you. That's because we start in the wrong place and so Lord, teach us today and every day to start with you, the one thing we're sure of, the one thing that's certain and solid and cannot be shaken, that you are our light and our salvation. You are the stronghold of our life. Though the waves crash against us, though bad diagnoses come, though tragedy strikes, though pandemic sweeps the nation and the world, you will not be shaken. And if we're with you, neither will we. So thank you, Lord, for who you are. Teach us to start and end there. Give us your grace. Give us the faith to trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.